Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, our economy is stagnating. And that's just not in the last year or two. That has been going on for years. Let me explain. Average per capita gross domestic product is stagnating. In other words, average national income has not been growing. Per capita output has not increased in years. In fact, last year it was roughly the same as it was five years ago in 2017. And flat per capita output in the face of skyrocketing prices for assets like housing, in the face of skyrocketing prices for consumables like groceries, is the reason why households are struggling to pay the bills. It's the reason why Canadians are feeling the pinch. It's the reason why Canadian families are taking on ever-increasing amounts of household debt just to make ends meet. And Canada's flat per capita GDP is in marked contrast with what is going on in other advanced economies, which are, skyro which are rocketing ahead of us. Research by John Cochran and John Hartley at Stanford shows that real GDP in Canada was just under 44,000 US dollars per person in 2021. In the United States, it was $61,000. $44,000 per capita here in 2021, $61,000 south of the border. That is shocking. American per capita GDP is now fully 40% higher than here in Canada. But even worse than the government's record over the last several years is the projection for the future. The OECD projects that Canada will only achieve 0.7% GDP growth this decade, putting us dead last, dead last amongst advanced economies. This projection is an indictment of this government's economic policies over the last eight years. And the government's own budget documents admit to this. One chart in last year's budget, Budget 2022, chart 28 on page 25, speaks a thousand words. It's titled, Average Potential Annual Growth in Real GDP Per Capita, Selected OECD Countries, 2020 to 2060. And this is what the chart says. It says that Canada's projected real GDP growth per capita will be dead last amongst advanced economies. Dead last. That chart is in the government's own budget documents. The budget in front of us, Budget 2023, does nothing to change this trajectory. The budget in front of us is the seventh budget. It should have been the eighth, but for the government, instead of presenting a budget in 2020, proposed an unprecedented power grab by proposing to give the PMO the power to approve taxation and spending for an unprecedented year and a half. And while they backed off that power grab, they set a dubious record for the longest period in Canadian history without introducing a government budget. And their lack of budgetary planning is beginning to show. The budget in front of us proposes billions in new spending in the form of consumption rather than investments for things like a dental program that, are, that is often covered by existing employer and provincial plans. Rather than meeting our international commitments to the rules-based international order by making investments, much needed investments, in our defense and our military, the government has chosen to spread more consumption in the form of programs that will further fuel inflation. The budget also proposes billions in new spending in the form of massive industrial subsidies, failing to heed the lessons of the past that massive industrial subsidies don't work. In fact, the finance minister said as much last month in Washington. She said she voiced concerns about large industrial subsidies and warned against, quote, a new mutually sabotaging competition to provide even richer corporate subsidies, end quote. Well, Mr. Speaker, that was last month. This month, the government has introduced massive new industrial subsidies in the billions of dollars for large corporations. None of these policies, gobs of new spending on consumption rather than investment, and gobs of new spending for massive industrial subsidies, none of these policies are working. Canadians' standard of living 
continues to decline. And many economists are now ringing the alarm bells. I want to quote recently from a piece published by Jonathan Delorier, Executive Director at the Walter Somers Foundation, and Robert Gagné, a professor at the Université de Montréal. Quote, in 1981, Canadians enjoyed a $3,000 higher per capita standard of living than major Western economies. Forty years later, Canada was $5,000 below that same average. If the trajectory continues, the gap will be nearly $18,000 by 2060. This is an alarming analysis. And in light of the recent $13 billion subsidy announced for Volkswagen, I'd like to quote another part of their analysis. Quote, Canada now remains stuck in an interventionist logic dedicated to protecting the immediate interests of Canadian companies. Successive governments have failed to move on from protectionist reflexes and impose the necessary reforms. They should have adjusted the regulatory framework to stimulate the competitiveness of Canadian companies in the domestic market. Instead, Canadian companies continue to operate within an outdated institutional framework that does not value competitive forces." End quote. And Mr. Speaker, here's what they conclude if the federal government does not change course. Quote, Growth will remain inadequate, and our standard of living will continue to quietly decline unless we put competition at the heart of Canada's economic strategy. End quote. None of this, Mr. Speaker, should surprise us. Massive industrial subsidies never worked in the past, and they won't work now. They distort the price of capital, leading to a less efficient allocation of capital, with the attendant declines in productivity and wage growth. Low productivity is the path to poverty. The only long-run determinant of, product, of prosperity is high productivity. Our aggregate GDP numbers, our top-line numbers, don't look too bad. But our overall GDP growth is underwritten by Canada's massive population growth. We have one of the highest population growth rates in the world, including in the developing world. That massive population growth is masking low per capita GDP growth. If the population goes up 3%, but GDP only goes up 2%, people are getting poorer. The masters of the universe types, the CEO types, the hedge fund types, they're all fine with flat, if not declining, per capita GDP growth, provided we have high population growth. Because it means more customers for them, by the millions, even if that average customer's disposable income is flat, if not declining. Because the number of customers times the number, uh, the disposable revenue per customer equals total revenues. And what the value, exact value of the number of customers is, what the exact value of the disposable income per customer is, doesn't really matter if the combination, the multiplication of these two values is higher revenues. Because on the profit and loss statement, higher revenues means higher profits, means higher pay and bonuses for the masters of the universe types. Meanwhile, ordinary Canadians suffer to the pay the bills as their per capita incomes stagnate. Mr. Speaker, let me finish by saying this. My parents immigrated to Canada. My father immigrated as a Chinese immigrant from Hong Kong in 1952. My mother immigrated as a Dutch immigrant from the Netherlands in the 1960s. They both left poorer countries and places to come to a much wealthier, more prosperous country. Decades later, the reverse is true. Mr. Speaker, we are in big trouble. We are falling behind big time. And we have a government that is utterly incapable of arresting this decline in our standard of living. And Mr. Speaker, for all the reasons I've outlined, I cannot support this government's budget and I cannot support this government.